Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 138 on Hispaniolan sloths with Dr. Robert McAfee of the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. This interview was a listener request, so please keep those coming in. And trolling back through my emails, I can't actually find who sent it, but make yourself known in the comments and you'll get the recognition for what has turned out to be a brilliant episode. So, where have we been for the last couple of months? Well, regulars to the show will already know the answer to that. And, as usual, I've been stuck in the middle of the sea doing biostratigraphy, this time with just a couple of hours notice before having to leave everything. It's a very nice rig that I've been working on, and I still feel very lucky to be working a paleo job, but it doesn't leave me with a lot of time to record and edit, and so I'm only getting to do that now I'm back on shore. So, if you are a postgraduate paleo student, or have a paleo degree, are a confident speaker, and are willing to learn how to record and edit audio, then I'd love to get some help with the show. I'll make a more detailed post on social media at some point, but in short, just get in touch. Anyway, back to this episode, and if you want to see some of the things that we're talking about, then make sure you visit our website where we have some great multimedia, including images, videos, and 3D models. And, as always, all the love you can give us on social media really makes all the difference. Likes, shares, comments, and subscribes are always appreciated, and this week I'm putting in a special request for reviews on iTunes, so thank you if you can leave us one. Our next episode has already been recorded, and that's going to be on Morella Morphs, so keep an eye out for that, but until then, I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me, Dave. Pleasure to be here. Right. We normally get to know our interviewees a little bit first before we start talking about all the science. And last time uh, with our last interviewee, I surprised her with some rapid fire, quick response questions, which I'm going to do with you today as well. Oh, my. So this isn't scripted. (laughs) <laughs> and you're going to be put under a whole load of pressure. All right, I'm ready for it. Hit me. Ready for it? Yeah. Okay. So, is it sloth or sloth? Uh, for me, it's sloth, but I fully recognize sloth. Okay. Potato or potato? Potato. Tomato, tomato? Tomato. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's call the whole <laughs> thing off. Uh, favorite hobby? Oh. Uh... I don't know anymore. My life has been taken up by my children, so whatever <clears throat> free time I have is usually devoted to them. So, what, I guess what's their I, favorite hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, lately, ignoring my wife and me and playing on their computers. All right, Fortnite then. Yeah, <laughs> understood. Uh, what would be your career if you weren't a paleontologist? Uh, probably something in biology. Uh, my major, my primary degrees were in biology, but I was. It was kind of why I liked doing paleology. Paleontology was I wanted to know more about how the animals lived. So if I couldn't do the extinct ones, I would do something with the modern living forms. Okay, favorite fossil? Well, sloths. Favorite living animal? Sloths. <laughs> Best personal fossil find? Oh, is it a sloth? No, it's not. It might be, but uh. <laughs> I'm going to say it's uh, a rhino jaw. My, Whoa. Uh, yeah, I was. I had an internship at uh, John Day Fossil Beds in Oregon in the United States, and uh, our first time out in the field, I was slowly working up the hill and found a little bit of tooth frag, followed it up, and ultimately it turned out to be a rhino jaw. So. Ah, that's awesome. Uh, field work or lab work? Lab work. Okay. I know, it sounds weird. I don't get many opportunities to do the field stuff, but mostly for me, lab work means being in the museums and the collections. You get to see all the stuff that's hidden behind. I feel like a kid in a candy store because I can open up all these drawers and just go, ooh, what's this? Ooh, what's, oh, look at that. So. And I guess the last one, I'll just make something up. Best, uh, most famous fossil specimen that you've ever seen with your own eyes. I would say the type material collected or brought back by Darwin on the HMS Beagle 
the original sloth specimens that I held. What? When I was, yeah. That's cool. When Where I got are to, those? Uh, at the uh, Natural History Museum in London. I got to go there. Ah, of I was working on my dissertation. So, but yeah, holding those, that was a, that was a surreal and kind of a spiritual those moment. Would have been the same bones that Darwin held. Yeah. That's, wow. That's cool. And I always like when you go into a museum and you see like your uh, paleontological heroes and y- you see the fossils that they've collected and the notes that they've written. It's such a weird connection that you've got your idols and the people you look up to. And now you're the one holding this material and reading what they've written. Yeah. And especially in some cases when, you know, the, the time span since then has been a couple hundred years. You're just mm. You have that connection to this you know, this person in the past that you just didn't expect. It's, it's, it's something. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So can we start off with uh, where your interest in paleontology first began? Sure. So I would say uh, like a lot, probably a lot of people in the paleo fields began when I was a a kid. What I specifically remember is one time my brother brought me what he claimed were saber tooth cat teeth to give me. Uh, I found out later they were just really horn corals, which are pretty common where I grew up. <clears throat> I grew up in an area that was high in kind of uh, Devonian Silurian deposits. So I grew up collecting bryozoans, uh, horn corals like crazy, brachiopods, all this stuff, and just had a bunch in my basement. But I remember that, you know, he suckered me in like, oh, they're, f- <laughs> they're fossil tiger teeth. Like, ooh, sweet. And I just never really grew out of it is how i tell people yeah the the paleozoic uh reef fauna uh, lovely lovely invertebrate stuff how did you end up working on sloths then what (laughs) happened well uh you know the invertebrates are nice and all and there were plenty where i was growing up but you know when you're a kid it's it's the dinosaurs and the bigger stuff that grabs the grabs the eye and the attention and the heart in a way and I had planned to do that for the longest time. And I don't know, by the time I got to high school, before I was going to college, looking at where I would go and all that, I kind of fell out of love with dinosaurs, didn't know what I was going to do. And looking around for graduate programs, I came across the person who ended up being my ultimately my graduate advisor, uh, Dr. Virginia Naples, and saw that she one of her side groups that she worked on was sloths. And I was like, huh, I'd forgotten about mammals. I don't, I don't know how I forgot about mammals and having a <laughs> fossil record, but I sure as heck did. So I... Uh, I knew a little bit about sloths and I looked into it a little bit more and I'm like, wow, big, weird, not a lot known. This is just a crazy group. And what can I say? I love the weird. So I was hooked. Sure. And you uh, have been working on Hispaniolan sloths. Uh, why from there in particular? <laughs> I got lucky, uh, extremely blessed to be working with the people in the and the taxa that I'm working with currently. I had previously written a paper, came out in 2009 on, uh, it was kind of the, the jugal and feeding mechanics of a little Caribbean sloth called Neocnus. And uh, I met someone at a conference that year who had seen that paper and she was working on fossils down in the Dominican Republic, which is part of Hispaniola. So there's Haiti and then uh, Dominican Republic make up Hispaniola. And they needed someone to help work on the sloth specifically. Her background was anthropology. They had someone to do bats, someone to do rodents, but they didn't have somebody to do the sloth. So <clears throat> she asked if I'd be interested. And I said, yes, because a lot of the material in North America and South America was kind of already in a way already had people had dibs on it in some sense. Um, there wasn't a lot of room or niche work for me. So the stuff in Hispaniola was wide open. And so that's kind of why, I jumped at the opportunity and it's been amazing. That's all I can say. Well, I can say a lot more than that. I should say. <laughs> right. So let's start off with the basics. I would like to get an idea of what a sloth actually is. So what is a sloth and what are the characters or characteristics that define this group of animals? All right. For those who don't know, sloths are small, at least today, small endemic mammals from Central and South America. So they've got all the basic mammal characteristics. <clears throat> Other things that define them, or I should say maybe go look at closest relatives. So their closest relatives, living relatives, are the anteaters. 
And after that, there's also relations to the armadillos, which seems weird, but that's the old former super orders in Arthra. Now you've got anteaters and sloths in Pilo- in Pilosa. So the sloths themselves uh, stand out or at least share characteristics with the armadillos by having a lack of enamel on their teeth. It's kind of a big thing. So it's just two layers of the softer, the stuff we have inside our teeth, the softer stuff and below the enamel is dentin. And so they've got two layers of that. So they've got ever growing teeth that kind of basically form their morphology based on that. But to differentiate them from the armadillos is they've got less teeth without enamel and versus the arm versus the anteaters. They actually have teeth where anteaters don't. Uh, there's a whole host of other things that get that, but that's kind of the main one that gets in there. Otherwise, you know, if you're looking at extants, small arboreal things that live in the trees for the most part, you mostly eat leaves, a few other things. Okay. And how much variation is there in modern sloths? So are there, you know, like 300 different species and they're all different sizes doing different things, or are they all pretty much the same slothy kind of shape and ecology? Well, the modern ones are pretty close in their morphology, but <clears throat> at least the when you look at the overall shape with all the flesh and stuff on top, <laughs> when you get down to the finer details, there's some good differences. So what's left today versus the fossil ones, there's only two genera of extant sloths, Bradypus, the three-toed or three-fingered sloths, then Calipus, the two-toed or two-fingered sloths. You kind of, some of us jump back and forth when we say toed or fingered, but because it's really the four the digits on the forelimb that are the ones that have the numbers. The hind foot is always three. So we have those two genera and they're, they look remarkably similar in some ways, but there are some good differences. And there's a number of species to each. Uh, interestingly, there's only two for the two toads, so they can count themselves on one hand. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> it used to be the same way for a bradypus, the three toed, but then they added a fourth one back around 2000. So there's, in total, about six species at all. Uh, but it, it's it's amazing because the two genera, they look somewhat similar, but they have widely different evolutionary paths. So they're actually one of the great examples of what we call convergence. Animals who evolved to have kind of similar appearance and lifestyle and habits, but from different, different sloth families. Okay. And um, what's the ecology like? Are they all just slow? Well, are they, yeah, both genera? just slow moving, hanging out in trees, eating leaves. Pretty much. Uh, they don't, they can move a good bit when they want to, uh, but predominantly that's the whole thing. That's why they have the name sloth. We think of the laziness that these don't do a whole lot, but actually they're, they're not the least or not the most slothful animal in the world. I think that's koalas. They sleep more than sloths do, but yeah, they'll mostly hang out in the trees, eat leaves, fruits, some other things. What is it about that ecology that is successful? Why does it work hanging out in trees, doing not a lot, and eating leaves in the same way that koalas do? I'm not entirely sure. I have this conversation with a colleague of mine, and we, there are times I, I don't know how sloths are still around today. I honestly don't. I'm glad they are. I love them to death, but they make no sense evolutionarily why they're still around. Um, I mean, there was some niche partitioning in them. I think that helps like the, between the two genera, one tends to live in more highland forests. The other one lives in more lowlands. So there's some things that happen with that that kind of helps out in some ways, but also it's another characteristic of Xenarthrans as a whole is this lowered metabolic rate. So then kind of get by on eating this not really nutritious diet of leaves and stuff because they're not spending a lot of energy. So Okay, and you say we don't know why they're still alive today. Um, Are they actually at risk, or are they doing particularly well? There are some species that are at particular risk. Uh, The one I mentioned, the most recent one that was created or recognized in around the 2000, uh, Bradypus pygmaeus, is a little one that lives off the islands, and where it is, it's a very fragmented habitat, and it's under threat for a lot of reasons. A lot of the others in various forests are also a little bit threatened. Some, again, some species are a little more critical than others. But. So looking in the rocks now and the fossil record, when and where do we see the first sloth, earth sloths evolve? All right. This is the kind of fun part. It's a long, extensive record, but it's also really spotty. So the first fossils show up about 
49 million years ago in the Eocene in South America. Uh, it's something that kind of stands out as being slothy. That's quite a way back. Yeah, it is. Uh, molecularly, there's been some molecular studies that push the origins of Xenarthrins back about, a, I can't remember, was it 100 million years? Or at least it's within, you know, Cretaceous period. <clears throat> near the end Cretaceous. So they're mammal forms that were slowly destined to become that. So in in essence, they represent one of the oldest mammalian orders potentially, but the fossils don't show up till later. And then, and then there's a big gap between that. So I said, the first one shows about 49 million years ago. The next one that shows up in the fossil record doesn't show up till about 30. So there's like a gap of 20 million years. We have no idea what's going on. Um yeah, that's staggering that the molecular de- evidence, which I guess is um, just looking at the differences uh, between the modern genera and their DNA and, you know, reconstructing a hypothetical family tree based on rates of evolution, that it would go back to the Cretaceous. Mm-hmm. So you've got Xenarthrans, which would be sloths, anteaters, and um, armadillos, a, a relative of all of those, would have been around at the time of the dinosaurs. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, there we go. And uh, the, the the first fossils that we actually see, is that just based on, uh, you were saying about the, the characteristics uh, of the teeth, and it's just layers of um, the dentine, is it? Uh, is is that fossil of a tooth that you can see that characteristic? Yeah, it's uh, as I recall, it's partial jaws or partial mandibles <clears throat> for both uh, the forty nine, the fifty one, and the thirty million years old one. We have those bits, and what it shows up interestingly is for the early type of sloth, it, it's reminiscent of a, a, a group we see later called the mylodontids, which are characteristic by having this. Uh, the last tooth in the series being what we call bilobate. So it kind of has like a figure eight or appearance to it. Although these are a little bit weirder too, because you actually see that a little bit in some glyptodonts too. So it's kind of showing kind of the relationship between the glyptodonts and, you know, those armadillo esque fossil forms and the early sloths. So they had some shared characters like that. And the one that's about 30 million years old is this thing called pseudo glyptodon. So as the name implies, its tooth looks really glyptodontish, but it has in the anterior part of its jaw this uh, really big tooth that's really round. And so in its loss, we call this a, a caniniform because we don't actually know that it's a true canine, but it's in the position we would expect a canine tooth to be, and it kind of has the shape of it. So it's caniniform, canine like. And so it's got this glyptodont tooth, but clearly a caniniform that a glyptodont wouldn't have, but a sloth would. So it's good. Really bizarre. <laughs> wow. Uh, so sloths in the fossil record, then, um, are they particularly well represented? Are there lots of species in the fossil record? There are. We are at about 100 recognized genera overall. Uh, so when I say uh, the pseudoglyptodon that shows up, uh, ligocene, we get a big explosion of sloths in the Miocene, so around 20 million years. So we're, we're having these jumps of time between stuff. So in the Miocene, Santa Cruzian of South America, there's just this explosion of sloth taxa. So we have, at that point, formed the major basic families that we recognize, which are the Mylodontids, the Megalonychids, and the Megatheres. And they're all fully formed, all fully diverse. So somewhere between that 50 million and that 30 million, they've gone and exploded, but they they just, they go crazy and they fill up large niches throughout South America, partially in part because South America was isolated during the tertiary. So there was, they were just free to do whatever they wanted on the island. Well, the continent, I should say, not an island, but a really big, big South American island. (laughs) And we kind of see some additional explosions throughout, you know, there's some gaps in the record here and there, but when they come about there, there's a lot of them. So, and again, it, it through, again, we're talking a span of 50 million years, a hundred different genera. I won't even get into the species because that's an even trickier <laughs> designation and fossils, but 
hundred recognized genera over that span of time and doing filling a lot of niches. Uh, the most interesting one is a, a sloth called Thalassocnus, which is found in uh, Peru. And it's got evidence partially because of the deposition the environment was found in. It was found off in, in seabeds. Clearly it was out in the seabeds and it's not one where it just got washed out there and you would think, okay, the sloth just happened to die out there. No, they found multiple ones continually. So this thing has been shown to have lots of adaptations for an aquatic lifestyle. No. Yeah. So it's the famous swimming sloth. But you've got I ones that got know really about this. Yeah, you've got ones that got really big, like Megatherium <clears throat> and Arematherium, stuff that was really small, like Haplops or the stuff in the Caribbean. So they were able to fill in all these different niches. I mean, aquatic land, uh, grassland living, semi mountainous living. There were probably more forested ones, but unfortunately, uh, things that tend to die in, fo- in forests don't fossilize all that well. Mm. And. Uh, yeah, they were all over South America. And then once the Isthmus of Panama formed back around the Miocene, late Miocene, about, what is it, somewhere between 10 million years ago, they started to migrate into North America as well. So. Wow. It's, I mean, I'm still trying to get around the aquatic sloth. So one of the questions I was going to ask is, um, you know, we've got this spotty, a fossil record and explosions of diversity. And I was going to ask whether or not that's an artifact of, you know, like a, a poor preservation or needing uh, to find the largest data to a site of special preservation to be able to get all of these arboreal uh, species. But then I was just so focused on sloths being, you know, like doing the same thing having the same ecology of just living in trees that i didn't consider the fact that they might be preserved in other environments and so could you imagine like not knowing about marine sloths and then you're just digging away in some marine sediments and all of a sudden you start finding all of these sloths in it well i mean i I could kind of imagine it's about the time that news came out was about the time I was starting to get in looking into sloths for studying them and all so forth. And that one blew my mind a good bit. It continues yeah. to blow my mind. It's doing it to me right now. This is <laughs> pure reaction of <laughs> me never having heard of a marine sloth before. Well, see, this so, goes back to, you know, why did I get interested in sloths? It's, Oh no, it's, I'm not going to get the, interested in sloths. No, I, I meant for me, but it's, it's, it, there's just the hook. There's so much weird oddities to them. They're, uh, they're glorious and, so many unexpected ways. No, but I'm saying for me, like throughout Paleocast, I've I've managed to get little side interests. Uh, I've managed to do it with soil and with charcoal, especially, and um, and now it's sloths potentially. <laughs> <laughs> They're well, weird ecologies. Um, They're easy right. to love. Um, so anyway, your recent work, as we've discussed, has been. Uh, focused on Hispaniola, the island in the Caribbean. But of all of the islands in the Caribbean, why that one? I mean, is it particularly slothy to the exclusion of all the others? Well, again, partially because I got lucky with being <clears throat> asked to help out with this project, initial project, and it's, it's ballooned beyond that. Uh, you kind of mentioned or asked, you know, we're spot you know, fossil records at spotty in some places or we're waiting for a logger stat and, and some things and at least what's going on in the dominican republic is that it's a bit of a logger stat of what we have uh we've got dry cave sites in some parts of the island where we've got fossils that come out of but we've also got these underwater caves which are producing these exquisitely well preserved almost perfectly preserved specimens and it's just coming up at a rate our, our colleagues who are collecting stuff, we just have so much material and it's not just loss. It's also, you know, uh, we get their monkeys, rodents, uh, bats, birds, uh, some insect stuff, all sorts of bits that were just giving us a whole view of what the overall ecology is. So it kind of settled on Hispaniola just for now, just because there's so much to work on, but I still want to look at the other islands. So Hispaniola represents one of the islands of the greater Antilles that are still Cuba Puerto Rico and Jamaica, and all of those have sloth fossils except for Port- or except for Jamaica. Its uh, geology came about too late for it to host any of them. 
So it's also interesting to look at what are the differences between the islands because there's obviously the spaces. They weren't really fully connected, even if you go back into Miocene times where the, the water might have been a little bit lower and the tectonics would have worked better. So it's Hispaniola for now, but there are plans to start kind of expanding and comparing to the other islands a little bit. I've got a good colleague who I'm going to go actually see later this week, uh, helping me out with some stuff in the Haitian fossils from Florida <clears throat> that are, I should say, they're housed at the University of Florida. But he's from Cuba, so we've been talking for a while about collaborating on some stuff there as well. Okay, so um, if we think about just the caves on Hispaniola then, are they commonly found with fossils in them? Or is, you know, even finding a couple of fossils in a couple of the caves something special? There seems to be a good number of caves that do have fossiliferous material. Uh, one of the groups we work with is the Dominicans, Dominican Republic's Biological Society, which is basically just a group of people who enjoy cave diving, underwater cave diving. And so they mostly do it for mapping stuff out, but they're more than willing to let us know where their fossils are at and go down and help with the collection. So it's stuff they kind of reckon see as they're going through and exploring new caves is how that part comes about. And I forgot the other part of the question. Sorry. I forgot the other part of the question as well. It's fine. <laughs> It's just the how common are they in caves there? Oh yeah, uh, so it's, that's... it seems to be pretty common. Uh, and even if you go to the mainland Sloss, there's a lot of evidence of cave usage by by Sloss throughout the years. Uh, there's one in North America called Nothotheriops that we've got dung balls for, you know, preserved fossil poop. There's even one in South America that has that too, Mylodon. It was just lots of cave deposits or lots of cave usage. And so these underwater caves were previously used, probably used by the sloths, the way it seems, but have later been filled with water, which is what has led to this excellent preservation that we're seeing. But again, that's not the only type of caves we have. There's other caves up in the mountainous regions. There's some past history of finding some specimens there. In fact, there's one I haven't gotten to see yet because it's in a really weird, I think it's now like an art museum. Don't ask me how this came oh, to be. Okay, it's, it's, it's specimens in an art museum, but it was, there was remains collected somewhere in north central uh dominican republic i guess the altitude was high enough that part of it preserved and kept it kind of cold and dry that it preserved some of the skin and intestinal contents wow so that's the other interesting thing about the hispaniola law so we think of megafaunal extinctions throughout the americas as happening around ten thousand years ago but the sloths on the islands lasted until about four to 5,000 years ago. So they, they avoided the mass extinction on the mainland. But what seems to have caused their extinction on the islands is the arrival of humans. So that's the other cool thing. The sloths were on these islands were just subsisting in an environment that didn't really have major predators, at least not major land predators. There were some giant eagles that probably could have eaten them a little bit, but they had no, no natural predators. They could just do what they wanted and fill a few niches. <laughs> so that's partly why we can get some great preservation too, because it hasn't had a lot of time to corrode or have other taphonomic effects. Wow. This is just blowing my mind. So. <laughs> my, my goal is to spread the, the, the towel of sloth, the joy and love of sloth. So <laughs> uh, I think there'll be a lot of people very interested in this, to be honest. I hope so. Um, so uh, you've touched on a, a few uh, points that I was going to ask you about. Uh, one was going to be about the collection of the fossils, especially underwater. So, you know, you, you've gone diving as part of the Speleological Society or whatever it is was called. Oh, I have, and you, they just found all of these bones and then reported it to someone somewhere. And if you want to go looking for more have you ever been diving yourself or do you just like put in an order please look for this when you're down there <laughs> i don't i don't do the cave diving uh there was some interest in trying to but the amount of time it would take to get certified and underwater cave diving is one of the more dangerous ones you can do and i don't think i'm uh, as a little more risk averse than that with <clears throat> with family i find nowadays so I'm happy just to uh, enjoy the spoils that our collaboration yeah. gets out. So I, I work with at least two museums down the Dominican Republic, the Museo del Hombre Dominicano 
who kind of started all of this. Uh, it sounds kind of weird because it's actually an anthropology museum. But within that, they found, you know, if they're monkeys, they have an interest. Mm. And so there were some, I think it was initially some schools in the U.S. were coming down and doing some dive work looking for indigenous people artifacts. I think it was the Taino people. And they found some, but they also found some monkey and other fossils. And they started collecting some <clears throat> in collaboration with that museum. And then the museum kind of took over some of that. And now it's also not located far from the Museo del Hombre is the Museo Nacional de Historia Natural in Santo Domingo. They've kind of taken over the collection of that with the in the collaboration with the DRSS, just because that fits their mission a little bit better. And yeah, there's just a lot. So I don't do the cave diving, but they go out together just when they kind of when the weather's good or the season is good to do it. Cause there's a couple caves they found to be really fossiliferous and it takes a lot to get it all up. And there's just so much more that's still down there. <clears throat> yeah, I bet. Um, is there any issue scientifically with the fossils being excavated by divers as in, do you get specimens back and they're all jumbled up? Is there any proper record of, sediment deposits and stuff like that or is it just this is what was in a cave that we managed to get hold of yeah there are a, a few difficulties and we're trying to work through some of it uh, just because the cost of you know the air breathing and other stuff it makes it a little more difficult to do some of the things we would like to such as just to have them go down and kind of document everything take photographs mm. of stuff before they pick it up so we don't really have that option we're working on it a little bit they'll sometimes go and take video and so that can help a little bit, but we mostly just try and work with, and I've put together kind of PowerPoint slides of, you know, this is the anatomy you're looking for. You know, these, this would be this bone on a sloth. This would be this bone on a sloth and try and get some ideas of you've been doing a great job of collecting stuff. I'm kind of missing these. Like I would really love some more hand and <laughs> ankle elements and I'm not getting a wrist and ankle, you know, can we keep an eye out for things? If, if it's near a finger bone and it looks like a rock, just pick it up please. I don't care. <laughs> I guess that's the point. Do you have to uh, kind of consider the fact that they'll most likely pick up a skull or something preferentially and not the tiny little bones that might also be incredibly informative? There is some of that, but there's a lot of paleo history focuses on cranial material, so it's not always a bad thing, but I mean, I'm making it sound like they're doing us a disservice here. Like, all of this is only possible because of them. So I think I will sing their praises some more. Um, <laughs> I definitely do. They do a fantastic job. And as I said, with with the collaborations and the communication, they know to kind of focus more on an... Because in some cases, you can see the, the way that the fossils are spread out. There's You can tell it's mostly an individual there. There hasn't been a whole lot of mixing once the water intruded into the caves. So they can mm. mostly try to grab all the stuff from one individual that they can and then come back. I also forgot crocodiles. I was thinking of that too, just an image of one of their videos. If you go to drss.org, or is it .com, you can see some of the videos from their collections and some of the caves, but big crocodiles too, they found as well. Awesome. Just, well, just amazing preservation. I'll, I'll see if I can link to that on our webpage because we put the images and any multimedia associated with this interview available for everyone to see. So I'll see if I can get hold of it and put it on the website if possible. Sounds good. I should also mention, cause you asked, you know, what have I, you know, what have I done or what's unique to Hispaniola for the, that causes all this, that there's a, a large limestone makeup that has allowed for all these caves to form later in the Pleistocene, which is why it, it all comes about. <clears throat> And you've got the filling, but there are other parts of the island have dry caves. And I have gone to some of those in kind of the more Western part of the island. And so these are still limestone caverns that have kind of formed, but the preservation there isn't as good. You've got kind of warm, moist soils. Mm. And so you get a little more fragmentary stuff, but there's still a lot of material there that can still be found. It's just kind of going through some caves are now open that weren't open before. And that's the other thing, too, that is kind of difficult with this, too. So in modern days of paleontology, for stuff that is so recent as fossil material, I mean, again, somewhere between 10,000 to 5,000 year old, this material is, 
you would think this had, would have a good opportunity to, to get some possible DNA material out of this to get some collagen or things, but the underwater ones kind of just wash it all out so we don't get anything from that. And then the thick kind of humid soils that we find them in in the dry caves kind of nullifies that too. So we get great preservation in some ways in terms of how they look, being nearly complete elements, but we lose out on that other material that would information that would be great to know to really pull in some more of the DNA about the ecology and things like that. Although with that, I will give this little bit that something unique that we just found not too long ago is that despite these being underwater caves or further proof that these caves used to be dry is that one, we've recently found coprolites. So fossilized poop from these sloths, or at least we assume they're from these sloths. There's some bits that are so big. Again, sloths were the biggest mammal on these islands. It couldn't belong to anything else. So we're excited about kind of gearing up to <clears throat> get together a team and investigate those so we can actually reconstruct their diet a little more readily. Yeah, we had an interview not too long ago uh, where we were talking about fossilized uh, poop and the beetles that were found inside it that had passed through the digestive tract of a dinosaur. So, yeah, cereal sectioning uh, coprolites is another thing that I'm now have an interest in and all of the information that that can bring. So, yeah, it's exciting stuff. It is. Um, so... Let's look at the um, the the slots that you've got there um, in a lot more detail. So, uh, what are some of the species you've got in these localities, and how do they appear different to modern species? For Hispaniola, I'm going to look at the genus level first. So, we've got three genera of fossil sloths: Parachnus, which is the biggest one that's kind of ground based; Acradachnus, which is Close in size to Parachnus, but has a lot more variability in what it could do. It seemed to be able to be terrestrial, but also a little bit up in the trees. And the Neochnus, which is the smallest one that seemed to have more specializations towards arboreality. And there's a number of species towards each, or signed to each, uh, most recently. Again, that's part of this. For Parachnus, we just now have a second species that we named not long ago, Parachnus dominicanus, based off of these underwater cave specimens. And there's at least one to two for Acradochnus and Neochnus is a bit of a, a dumpster fire in its species right now. So there's similarities, at least with all of them, because they're kind of classified as megalonychids, uh, meaning they belong to the family megalonychidae. Although there's some genetic material or genetic studies recently that point that they might be their own kind of subfamily, megalochnidae which might just represent an early separate radiation of the megalonychids too. It gets crazy in that and i don't want to <laughs> i feel like i'm getting lost in the weeds on that description mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> but to to, the, to bring this home is the two-toed sloths are considered to be megalonychids so they've got some shared characteristics with the modern two-toed sloths uh one of the big things is, is they've got a giant anterior tooth the caniniform that looks a lot more canine in shape it's really this triangular shape it's kind of bladed from where it rubs against the other ones and with Neochnus, some of the uh, characteristics that seem to indicate arboreality as well are located with that as well. But the other thing, too, is also the canine is well separated from the malariforms by this nice space, so uh, we call it diastema. So it gives them a really, uh, I guess, fierce look to them in a way for something that's probably <laughs> rather gentle. But because that nice, sharp caniniform, it looks a little fierce in some ways. Okay, so looking at these three genera, what have you been trying to figure out? So which hypotheses have you been looking to test with them? So uh, much of my career, I wanted to do things that were looking at functional morphology. How did these sloths move? How do they do their lives and things of that nature? But invariably, I've gotten bogged down in trying to determine taxonomy. It's no good to investigate something and find that oh, I've been looking at what this sloth could do, but you realize you've got two different sloths and that would actually mess things up. So I get stuck in taxonomy. So my initial impetus in all this was kind of, now we had all these new fossils from the Dominican side of the island, the far eastern side. But previously, back in the 1970s, a whole bunch of stuff had been collected from caves throughout Haiti. 
So now we had two different sides of the island, and we knew in the past they were a little bit separated too. So that brought up questions of if we have greater samples, what does that A tell us about interspecific variation? Because if we look at just us as ourselves, humans, we all know we're humans, but we all look a little different, right? We've got variation within our species. And in fossil records, when you don't have a lot of specimens, you don't really know what the interest of variation is. You know, that's why a lot of species kind of get erected rather quickly because you don't have a large depth of specimens to say, oh, that's just part of the normal variation. That's not really new or novel. If we had a wide range, we'd see that just fits within. And so we kind of approached it with that. What is the level of interest variation we have within these sloths if we have more sides of the island? And with interest variation, your sources can be either sexual dimorphism, you know, classic thing, males being a little bit bigger in body size and dimensions than males. There's biogeography. The Haitian caves tend to be a lot more at high elevations, over a thousand meters from sea level. Or the Dominican stuff is, at least the stuff we've collected, is a lot more closer to sea level. And then there's also temporal differences. You know, what what time period are these things occurring in that might relate to speciation? So we kind of approached it from that. And again, as I kind of mentioned, with the lack of ability to get collagen out of these things, and we can do some radiometric dating, but it's not great. So we don't really have the temporal context. But we do have biogeographic, and with the larger sample of specimens, we have the kind of more physical sexual dimorphism dimensions to look at the interest of variation. And so through that, we found some interesting things. Uh, again, it was trying to see if that would affect speciation. I'll be honest, I'm more set out to work on Neocnus because I thought that was the problematic one because it had three species erected to it. And the last two were really close in body size, but it was really based on size, but there wasn't a lot of variation with within them which you would expect a little more variation for a species. So we set off and we measured a lot of things, looked at it and found out that there were some interesting variations there. So which lines of evidence were you able to draw upon to test the sexual dimorphism? Was it of particular bones? Um, Was it ratios of one bone to another? What was it that you were actually measuring? So for looking at the sexual dimorphism components, went with the idea that if you're going to have sexual dimorphism, one animal is going to be a little bit bigger than the other if if you have actual dimorphic sexes. And in extant sloths, and even some of the the armadillos too, there is some evidence that you get larger individuals of one sex than the other. And interestingly, for some a little bit opposite the normal rule that we think of that males are larger than females. Sometimes it's the females that are larger than the males. So we operated on that and I used not so much ratios, but I used bone element lengths again with these, uh, with the great preservation of the Island, we were able to get a lot of limb bone elements that were complete. So I was able to take that and I just used total bone length as kind of a proxy for body mass because that was going to be the best correlate for it. You can start taking widths and things, but once you start taking finer measurements, it's not really necessarily related to size, whereas the total length of it is. And so we plotted it all out and found that they're within, just looking at the individualized tax themselves, kind of ignoring species for the most part, at least for the genera that we could do that. So for Parochnus and Acratochnus, we found that there was a bit of a separation that you had some individuals who ended up being a little bit larger and some who ended up being a little bit smaller and you had a couple in between, but by and large, it looked like we had two, what we call size morphs, you know, a larger one and a smaller one. No idea which would actually correspond to male versus female, but it definitely seemed to indicate that there was something going on that would indicate some sort of sexual dimorphism. And at least through other fossil sloths, I can say we've, we've, slowly been able to find more evidence of that in other fossil taxa as well has been going on. So we also looked at that with in correlation with location. Again, all these fossils were coming from various caves, individual caves. So we kind of treated those as subpopulations and we said, all right, on the whole, if we look at across the island, we get some larger specimens and we get some smaller specimens within these. But does that hold up at the location level, at a subpopulation? And we found that it did that within each individual cave site, you had a consistently a larger set of specimens and a smaller set. 
but again, with not too far off from each other that you would think new species, at least until we got to Parochnus. And that one became a little bit more outside the realm of just, oh, interesting variation. That became the realm of something. This looks to be something completely different and how much size difference there was. So even within those subpopulations, we found that there was still a large morph and a small morph. But if you kind of looked at them across the whole island, there were some that were large and small that were still a good order and size bigger than the large and small from another part of the island. So that one became a new species then? Yes, that was the uh, Parochnus dominicanus. Okay. Um, Was that expected that you would be able to see or to be able to uh, kind of put a ring around these on a graph and say, okay, that's too big to be just variation within a species. It's got to be a whole new species. It was wholly unexpected. Uh, As I said, originally started off looking more at Neognus for all of this. But we threw in the Parochnus and the Acradochnus just to kind of, you know, you're going to collect data. You might as well collect it all and uh, <clears throat> run it sometimes and see what happens. So it was completely unexpected. It's It's been a pleasant surprise. I honestly never thought I would name a new species in my life of anything, especially not for sloth. So that was has been an amazing thrill. But yeah, it was very unexpected. Looking at the data and just, it made, it made sense. It just... You're looking at the, we're looking at Parochnus from known localities, and thankfully we had a good separate or a good set of collections within uh, the Museo del Ombre from the underwater caves. There was one that was near near to Santo Domingo, and the stuff that was became the type localities for Parochnus dominicanus was further off on the eastern side of the island. And so, within each of those caves, there was a good number of individuals. So it wasn't just there was was one individual. The one that was Parochnus serus, which is the original type species for Parochnus, had an interesting set where you had, and I'd seen this in the type locality too, where you had evidence of a really big individual who was an adult, a smaller individual who was an adult, and then a juvenile whose dimensions would be bigger than the small adult. What? Yeah. So in a way, it almost it almost looked like it was indicating that there was a family unit of sorts here. You know, potential bull male or bull female, and a smaller male or female, and then a juvenile that would have been the sex of the big one. And it's not uncommon. We actually see this in some spe- in some cave specimens of Megalonyx jeffersoni, which is the again another megalonychid that's known from North America in cave deposits. We have evidence of them doing that. But then I was also seeing evidence of this in the the localities that became the type localities for Parochnus dominicanus as well, that you had large morph, small morph, and in some cases a juvenile that was around that size too. But so I had those as comparisons to work with. And the stuff that was definitely Parochnus aris was much bigger than the stuff that was coming out as dominicanus. And it looked closer not want to base it fully on size uh, completely. I think some recent stuff that's come out about uh, blowing the paleo news about possibility of multiple species within Tyrannosaurus Rex has set off that debate again as well as to what size means in a speciation. Mm. So dived in closer. I mean, there was definitely a size discrepancy, but it wasn't something where you thought that the stuff from the Alta Gracia caves, which are the Parochnus Dominicanus were just a submorph you know, sexual morph of the Parochnus dominicana specimens. Again, because each site showed that variation that you would expect or would look to be more, to be sexually dimorphic within. So we knew it wasn't just a small sexual dimorph of Ceres. Looked at the close, looked at the individual elements closer in comparison and found a number of characteristics that definitely differed between them. Some that you would expect based on size, just because you're a smaller individual. As a smaller individual, you'd expect some features to be a little bit smaller or less prominent. But there were some characteristics that were definitely not related to size that differed in the morphology. So we felt pretty confident from all of that in saying that it was a new species. Okay, so when you're actually handling the bones in the museum, had you uh, consciously or subconsciously 
recognized any of those differences? Did they only come out after you did the analysis? It was only after the initial analysis. As I said, I went in fully expecting that the taxonomy that we knew was the taxonomy that was going to be. I probably shouldn't have. It was probably a little bit of my naivety, but it was also a simpler matter just to believe that anything that was Paracnus was going to be Paracnoceros, and anything that was Acradocnus was going to be Acradocnus, yay. And the Neocnus would be have to be figured out as what they were. But luckily, the Neocnus weren't that prevalent on the far side of the island, so... Okay, and and with the paleo geographic ranges, were you able? To, are you able, or were you able to see any evidence of the differences between these genera and species of where they were each living? Could you uh, take time slices and just say at this time these were where the populations of each sloth were living? Not so much from the time aspect. Again, we don't have a really good stratigraphic feel for where they fit temporally within the context of the island. I mean, we know within late Pleistocene to Holocene, that's about 5,000 years ago. But we can't really say too well. There's been some dating on the Haitian ones, but they're all pretty close, somewhere between thirteen to 5,000 years. So there's some possible speciation there. But no, it was more about looking at... <clears throat> the locations. And I think the more interesting part is going to be go back and kind of map out the paleo biomes on the island. As I said, the Haitian stuff is a lot more from, from upper highland areas, highland caves, stuff that's elevations of over a thousand feet. And a lot of the stuff from at least so far we've been collecting on the Dominican side is more lowland, but you still see most of the genera occurring in either one of those. Now, some of the numbers differ a little. Like I said, we don't see a lot of Neocnus on the eastern side of the island. Well, I should say we didn't. We've got one cave that I'm working on right now that has a whole host of Neocnus. <laughs> but by and large, it's been it's been fairly rare on the eastern side of the island, so maybe it's, it doesn't like the lowlands. Uh, Paracnus seems to prefer the lowlands a little bit more. It's more common over on... We found it more prevalent in a lot more of the cave deposits on the... On the Hispaniola, on the sorry, not Hispaniola, on the Dominican Republic side of the island, than we have on the Haitian side, and then you find Acradocnus everywhere. But if you look at the overall morphology of these things, again, uh, Paracnus is one of, is one of the larger sloths on the overall Caribbean islands. The biggest one being Megalocnus, which is known from Cuba. Uh, they're somewhat closely related, and probably maybe about the s- size of a small black bear. I think it's the best uh, estimate we can give for that one. And so it, it was definitely more terrestrial than that. But Acradocnus, its features kind of show the ability to climb in general. It could be on the ground. It could climb decently if it wanted to in trees. So I think that's why we find it pretty much in every cave deposit because Acradocnus was just not limited by its morphology. It could go anywhere and everywhere, highlands, lowlands, rocky, forested, just everywhere. In, in caves as well? Were they living in caves or did they just fall into them? after they died or before they died it's, and then died. That's all. It's, yeah. It's always a good question. It seems to be a bit of both. And we think maybe that's why we don't find the so much in these caves is that they were able to climb out pretty readily. There is an amazing specimen of Acrat Ocnus though we have that showed a healed uh, break in its femur. It is just riddled with all this osteoarthritis and osteoarthrosis evidence. It looks absolutely alien in appearance but it clearly this was a sloth that fell broke its broke its thigh bone at some point but healed enough and then overhealed is just it looks so bizarre and had a relatively good long life until it died i'm guessing of relatively natural causes so it definitely seems to be that they were living in the caves to some extent based on some of the healed breaks and osteophytes that we've seen in some of the elements yeah, it, it healed and led a, a good life until it fell into the cave again. <laughs> or just died in the or cave. Died in the cave. <laughs> I'd say good good but gimpy. That would that was it looks painful. Yeah. Remind me, I'll remind me, I'll send you a, a an image awesome. of it if you want. Um so then I guess just in in general, are uh, might there be even more species of sloths? Uh, cryptic species of sloth, and what I mean by that is like um, 
hiding in between the definitions of what you've already uh, set out. Like there could be another Paracnus or Neopnus uh, species within the data just waiting to be discovered. I would say based on the lessons I've learned from my, as I've found out my naive assumptions of not expecting to find anything, that there most definitely is the likelihood of something else of another species being present. In fact, I'm headed down this week to the collections at the University of Florida to look for evidence of that. So we've got some stuff from a, a cave we call Cueva Macho. I don't know why it's called Cueva Macho, but that's what, that's what, our, <laughs> that's what our cave divers named it. <clears throat> but from this, we had a bunch of Neocna specimens that showed a very interesting uh, jugal arch morphology, which is the uh, cheekbone for, for sloths. Normally, it's not connected to to make a zygomatic arch, but these have a complete zygomatic arch. And for a sloth their size, they really shouldn't. And I'm giving away all the great stuff of this paper. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, you heard but, it here but, first. Yes. <clears throat> but in looking at that, the skull and just the attachments of the jugal look a lot different from other Neocna specimens that we know, from mostly from the Haitian side, but even some from the Hispaniolan side. So my colleague at the Museo Nacional really wants it to be a new species, and I'm you know, pushing caution because I always hate to jump into whether it's a new species or not. Mm. But he's got me coming around that maybe it is. So it, there might be a new uh, species in the Ocnus, which is problematic because I still don't really know what to do about the other three and if how valid they are. <laughs> and that's also to say from some stuff from the Biogeographic paper, I want to take another look at Akrat Ocnus too because there's some stuff that shows – the stuff on the Haitian side tends to shift in size and ratios a little bit from the stuff on the Hisp- on the Dominican side. So there might be another one there too as well. Well, you've given away all of your information now. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get scooped. I, I think we should go go even further and come up with a name for it. So uh, Neocnus hispaniolensis. I don't know. I'm torn as to what I... What we should name it, and I think I want to Haleocasti. That's a good one. <laughs> because of the 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 jugal morphology, I had one friend suggest we should maybe call it Bucolensis, so the cheeky Neocnus. But oh, I've got to run. Really? I've got to run that by my colleagues first and see what they think. <laughs> we, we haven't gotten to that part. I'm, I'm holding off on on uh, workshopping names until I feel a little more secure about <laughs> things. <laughs> oh, that's every time I go to uh, dig somewhere. So I went to uh, the Arctic and I was digging for sea scorpions and I was just the whole time, I was just so sure that I'd find the new species that I just w- was walking around coming up with all of these different names. Any place I was going to, I was just like, Oh, just put Ensis on the end of that. How does that sound? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm always naming new species and never, never describing new species. Um, You're braver than I am. <laughs> Or maybe Almost. that's the tr- maybe that's the trick. You know, it's the not expecting it, and that's when it happens. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe I'm just overconfident in my ability. I just got to start looking at data rather than just hacking away at clips and hoping. Well, you got to have hope. If there's no hope, then it never <laughs> comes about. So it's it's better to be optimistic. I would probably would say. Yep. Right. So, which questions about sloth evolution? have we still yet to answer oh so many so many or which are the big ones oh biggest one that comes to my mind and this isn't necessarily related to my research but it touches upon it nonetheless is about the real relationships between all these hundred some different genera the molecular stuff has aided in some ways like i said there's been some ancient dna studies or midogenomics that have added to it and i'm hoping we can get more of that to kind of fill in the gaps because that's actually produced there were, there were two studies about three or four years ago that came out about the same time and they showed some similar results but also some things that were a little different and so it'd be nice to get some better resolution for interestingly uh Kalipas, the two-toed sloth keeps pulling towards the mylodontids and i always wonder if that's just because we don't have enough megalinic dna to kind of reset it but it also shows some different origins for the Caribbean. So it kind of touches on that too. And then also there's just other places in South America, like over in the Andes, we find some interesting older stuff, but it's a lot more fragmentary. 
but you know, more field studies to kind of fill in those older gaps, you know, between those 30 to 20 million years to find out better what's going on in those places and how that tells us how these groups originally evolved. Again, we got big gaps. It'd be nice to know when did more of the characters that we think of are as truly sloth come into being. And then how did that lead to the diversification diversification of the major family groups that we recognize? Okay. Is, is finding specimens a big part of answering those questions? I think it's always a big part of it. Uh, <clears throat> the more material, the better, I would say. Like I said, if we've got large gaps, trying to find fossils within those gaps gives us the data that we need. And I would also say, just from my end, the data that comes from having a larger sample allows you to answer questions about interest of variation and what it means to really be a species. I'm doing air quotes on that because sometimes it is, at least in the fossil form, a rather nebulous construct of what we decide a species is. Mm. And if you've only got a couple specimens, you don't really get a a good feel for the variation that individuals can have and still be part of the species. Well, I know that Paleocast is huge with the South American diving community. We've got thousands of them listening. So uh, write in, we'll put you in touch. They'll find <laughs> thousands of new specimens for you. Hopefully that'd be fantastic. I know the, the cenotes in in the Yucatan peninsula of, around Mexico have been paying off a lot lately too. So, Okay, and finally, what would you tell a a student who has listened to this show and has got them thinking, yeah, fossil sloths might be for me. What would you tell them to get them interested in the field? <laughs> I don't know what else I could tell them beyond what I've talked about today, other than just do it. It's a uh, beautiful absurdity is what sloths are. Uh, so widely diverse doing so many different things. They're so strange, so bizarrely beautiful. And there are just so many questions to be answered. You can, I mean, I've honestly, some people look at me a little strange, like, why are you just so focused on sloths? I'm like, how can I not be? There's so many questions here. This is a group I can spend my life studying and still never come close to having all the answers I would like to. Sure, I should probably diversify and look at some other animal groups, but this absurd weirdness just pulls me back constantly and I I'm hooked. And I think anybody who really starts looking at sloths and just embraces that bizarreness would be hooked too. Okay. Well, I very well might be. So, uh, I'm sure we'll get you back on another day and we can talk about more absurdly weird and wonderful sloths in the future. I'd love to, I don't get to do this very often. My, my family won't let me talk about sloths for more than <laughs> is there a ten minutes. So the, <laughs> a little bit around the dining bit. table. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll, they know I'll go on far too long and far too much. So I appreciate opportunities like this. So really, thank you for letting me come on and talk about my favorite topic in the world, Dave. Well, thank you for coming on. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall-Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.